Well, thank you very much for the invitation. In fact, there will be, in about 10 to 15 slides, a little bit about different presentations of progressive aphasia in different languages. Now, I have to say I share the first speaker's, Professor Hoyting's, feeling that when I got this topic, I felt sl I, mean, I was very, very happy to be invited to Trieste. I knew it's a beautiful place. I've been here before. And I have to say, in my experience, Italians organize the best conferences anyway. So from this point of view, I was very happy. But then looking at the topic, I thought, oh, what's really new? Now, in a way, I think like in many other things in life, you can make two narratives about it. One is, oh, we have now all these new exciting things, social cognition, uh, language, aphasia being recognized in this context, and psychosis in MND, and so on and so on. On the other hand, if we look at it, most of those things have been well described about 100 years ago. We are just paying attention, or we started paying attention to it. So I would like to start with what I think we have a consensus and in my tradition of being a little bit of agent provocateur also address controversies, open questions and also some things where I think we might be going wrong. So the first thing which I think all of us will agree and I mean in fact the first slide of the first presentation, Professor Hoyting was showing it, uh, FTD is not a unitary phenomenon and PPA, primary progressive aphasia, is not a unitary phenomenon. And that has been very well developed practically in late 20th, early 21st century, based on the tradition of cognitive neuropsychology, and particularly the idea of double dissociations, that you can have two patients, two diseases, and in one, one function is well preserved, the other is impaired, in the other the opposite. And the kind of classical example of that uh, was usually the opposition between semantic dementia and non progressive aphasia. So, in semantic dementia, people lose concepts which are well preserved in non fluent progressive aphasia. In non fluent progressive aphasia, you have more or difficulty in rep repeating things, pronouncing things, and so on, which is preserved in semantic dementia. And logically, and here already out of banal, sometimes we can get to kind of more interesting insights, here comes already the question that assessment and treatment need to be multidimensional. And one important thing, I mean, until today, I can't tell you how many papers I get to review where then I say, I see something about language assessment and the only assessment of language is naming. Language is not only about naming black and white line drawings. Please, I think that is a very, very important point. If we believe that there are these different sim syndromes, then we have to go beyond naming. We have to include comprehension, we have to include repetition, and other things I will come to in more detail. Now, I mean, just to give you an example of this kind of double uh, or opposite presentation, when I was working in Cambridge over 10 years ago, the kind of big controversy in, I would say, the symptomatology of of semantic dementia was what I call here the view from Chicago and Boston, the view from Cambridge, Manchester and Lund, whether semantic dementia is really a fluent progressive aphasia, so primary problem is with language, and it's a fluent aphasia with nonverbal deficits being attributed to additional agnosia. That would be view very much proposed by Marcel Mesulam, who practically reintroduced the uh, progressive aphasias to the Western world in 1982. They have been well described by Arnold Pick, but that would have been about 100 years ago. And the view in Cambridge was it was primarily a memory problem, so the term semantic dementia is a form of dementia. And of course, if you have concepts, you also lose the names. And that provided for a lot of papers in one or the other direction. I would say by now we reached the kind of conclusion that both is correct. So I would say also the Cambridge group recognized that there are grammatical problems, and I will give some examples later on. Also, I would say the transatlantic group would recognize that it's probably a problem of which goes well beyond language itself. So that would be an example of a controversy, I would say, resolved in this case through an honorable compromise. Now, what I think is still very, very open, and for many years as the president of the World Federation of Neurology Research Group on Aphasia, Dimension and Cognitive Disorders, I was trying to animate people to do symposia on that and look at it, is how do aphasic syndromes in progressive aphasia relate to stroke aphasia? So, 
Non-frontal progressive aphasia has some similarities with Broca's aphasia in stroke, with this labored speech, slow, um, slow production, phonological difficulty, and so on, but it's not quite the same. And semantic dementia is clearly quite different for Wernicke's aphasia. I think one of the problems here is that there are very, very few researchers who really work at the same time with stroke and neurodegeneration. So the reason why we have so little of direct comparison is basically due to a yeah, logistics of research. Then we have a lot of heterogeneity within syndromes. I think I find it very problematic, I'll come to it later, later when I speak about motor neuron disease, to say patients with motor neuron disease have problems with social cognition. Well, some do, some don't. And I think what we have learned is that even within SD or an FPA, or I will come in a moment to longopinic aphasia, there is quite a lot of heterogeneity. And syndromes evolve. So it's not that you have the same pattern. Again, I will come to a bit later when I speak about the evolution between a CBD and, and an FPA. Now, one thing which I would still say is quite puzzling, and for me at least, and uh, I wonder whether anybody here has good ideas for discussion, is the puzzle of laterality. Why are some diseases quite clearly symmetrical, behavioral variant is relatively symmetrical, I would say. Semantic dementia is very asymmetrical, and within semantic dementia, we see many more left and right-sided cases. Now, is it because they manifest more easily, because language is something that you will recover uh, or recognize very fast, and right-sided semantic dementia will end up as being seen by psychiatrists with possibly more, more kind of behavioral problems? Or is it indeed a real asymmetry? Is this kind of more intensive use of left hemisphere through language in some way leading excitotoxicity, excitotoxicity and so on to a more frequent pathology. I would say a very interesting question. I think there are now studies also of distribution of pathology in both hemispheres, which for me is still very open and very interesting. Now the second consensus, and here we are moving to something which I find even more interesting, is that these PPA variants have biological validity. So again, I was very pleased at the first slide. You could see semantic dementia on the left and non-fluent progressive aphasia on the right. Now, the reason why I think it's important is because it means that all these linguistic differences, which people could say, oh, well, this is just, you know, looking for, you know, uh, some really irrelevant things and very, very fine language grade well, they seem to reflect the underlying neurobiology of language. So in a way, I would say, of course, they are still <coughs> not everything maps, but in a way, I would say, I'm rather surprised how well the purely clinically and linguistically defined categories map now into what the biology, molecular biology, genetics, and so on brought over the last 10 years. So in a way, I think we have a lovely example of convergence of the clinical and basic science. And in a way, this against the background of the great advances in neuroimaging, molecular genome genetics, but also from a change from the ideas of static centers to interactive networks. So in a way, that's something which clearly is the case in neuroscience, but I think also clinically we are not expecting as much isolated syndromes as we did before. I will come to it in a moment. Now, a, I mentioned already this kind of beautiful double dissociation between semantic, semantic dementia and non fluent progressive aphasia. Of course, uh, Marie Lugorno Tempini uh, brought a little bit of a movement into this by proposing the category of logopenic aphasia, which now is more and more recognized, where the definition is in fact more strongly related to pathology. And here the question is these are, so to say, the patients who later turn out to develop Alzheimer's disease. Now, that would be a topic in itself, and I'm very happy to go into discussion. The problem with logopenic aphasia is that, in a way, the definition, let's say, the definition of non fluent progressive aphasia compared to logopenic aphasia is very much built around a grammatism and apraxia of speech, both of which are themselves quite complicated and contentious categories. So, here we move to kind of consensus, although we will be leaving in the consensus soon, of relationship to non-aphasic syndromes.
Now, Mesulam's original criterion was to have a completely isolated aphasia for two years. I think that was the first. Then he made, went back to one year. And still in a paper written last year, he said, well, we still need a relatively isolated aphasia. But how isolated does it need to be? We have well recognized PPA overlap syndromes, above all corticobasal degeneration, motoneuron disease, which in a way again develop against the background of a progressive integration of movement and cognition, both in neuroscience and in clinical sciences. We realize that we cannot really divide things into dementia and movement disorders, as we believe for a long time, because most movement disorders have a cognitive side, most cognitive disorders very often have a, a movement side. And it goes even beyond this movement cognition uh, idea to uh, posterior cortical atrophy, for instance, where the question now arises are they allowed to have movement language disorder? And then if it's kind of relatively more language, relatively more visual spatial, what means relative? So I think the ideas of isolated syndromes is becoming progressively difficult. Now, very quickly, corticobasal degeneration. I mean, here, the aphasia is now enshrined in the new diagnostic criteria of Armstrong, and the clinical pattern on NFPA seems to be so, of, of CBD seems to be so similar to non friend progressive aphasia that both have been described as two ends of a continuum. And here we come to this language evolution that sometimes you can have patients who start developing first the kind of motor feature of CBD and then progressive aphasia, but you can see something developing the other way around. If you follow up patients on both ends long enough, you will find that this overlap is becoming bigger and bigger. So I think the arguments are growing that in a way we have a spectrum here. Now again, interesting question, laterality. This is something I'm particularly proud of because I've been author to papers which contradict each other completely, which I think is good because the that I don't really have a preconceived idea. I think it's a very open question. Theoretically or intuitively would believe that a right-sided presentation of CBD, and therefore left hemispheric involvement, should produce more patients with aphasia. And some studies show it, some don't. So again, I would say laterality is for me a very interesting question and goes through most of those diseases, and I would say we know remarkably little about it. MND-associated aphasia, here the occurrence of aphasia in MND is documented back into 19th century, but now became very much, so to say, general knowledge. And in fact, it's now an integral part of Edinburgh Cognitive Assessment, ECAS, which I developed with Sharon Abrahams, where, so I would say generally, most people recognize that apart from behavioral and frontal executive functions, language is one of the main, or aphasia, presentations of, cognitive presentations of motor neuron disease. But here again, we have some questions or interesting issues. Because those things do not really fit into the three PPA variants. And I mean, I was telling it for you know, the last 10 years, I'm quite glad that more and more papers are coming now in, I mean, for example, from Julie Snowden Group from Manchester, showing it now in numbers, that in a way you don't really have a MND with clean, clear, semantic dimension on NFPA. They have more severe comprehension impairment than most other aphasias, more severe verb deficit, more frequent spelling impairment, for instance. So they are features which are different. And a couple of years ago, it led me to the idea that, in fact, MND and FTD might be not one or two, but three diseases. So the combination of both is not just an addition. It's an interaction causing, therefore, different symptoms. Now here. An important point. I think we should be careful not to kind of go into other extreme. I remember 10, 15 years ago, I would come to an audience like this and try to convince people that there is something like cognitive disorder in MND, there is dementia, there is uh, aphasia. Now I feel like I have to convince people not all people are demented. Not all people are facing. I think we went kind of from one extreme to the other, and not all people have uh, deficits in social cognition and so on and so on. That's exactly the reason why we need to do proper cognitive assessment, because we cannot simply assume because a patient has MND, a patient will have this, this, and this. We have really to decide it. They are different clusters of syndromes, but 
please remember it's not that MND is automatically uh, dementia. And the kind of related issue here was, of course, embodied cognition, which in a way I would say was, again, an incredibly exciting topic about 10, 15 years ago. I would say now it is less exciting because everybody believes in it. So in a way, it's a good example of an area which kind of got a little bit out of fashion because of consensus. Uh, the idea that, in fact, there is a deep connection at the brain level between visualizing a movement, thinking about it, conceptualizing it, and, and between uh, conducting it. Okay, so now let me just speak about something which in a way probably you would not even have thought to hear in a talk like this. Uh, but do we really know that much about progressive aphasia beyond English language? Now, a few years ago, I did a study with a student of mine looking at the papers on aphasia, and not surprisingly, the vast majority, 61% of them, were on patients. So it's not about the language in which the paper was written, it's the language spoken by the patient. So 61 is a very, very clear majority in English. Then we have German, Italian, Dutch, French, Spanish, Chinese, the first non-Indo-European language, come at 2%. Greek, and then practically we are below 1%. So in fact, most of what we know, we know only on a small group of languages. And interestingly, if we look now into progressive aphasias, this is even more pronounced. So the imbalance towards practically almost all studies being done on English speakers is stronger in progressive aphasias than in stroke aphasias. There's practically hardly anything about progressive aphasias in non-European languages. Now, does it matter? Well, I would say yes. I mean, one thing is that all the models, so here we looked, for instance, the number of citations and languages, and we found that by citations between 13 and 50, 15 were English and Italian. When you look at papers which had more than 50 citations, all of them were on English-speaking patients. So that means all the models have been practically developed on English. It's even more biased if we go into therapy. 85% of therapy patients, I mean, are on English, and more than 90% on the trials of English, German, Dutch, relatively close related three uh, Germanic languages. So I would say what we believe to know about progressive aphasia, we know assuming that all patients are English-speaking monolinguals. Now, why does it matter? Well, one is, let's start with simple things like phonetic phonology, tonal languages. We have no clue, for instance, how tone is represented in terms of semantic dementia, the most commonly spoken language on earth. Grammatical gender, that's my favorite example, because one of the problems, of course, is that very often the tests are developed in English and then translated into other languages. Now, of course, if English doesn't happen to have a certain phenomenon, no translation will ever capture it. So if English doesn't have tones, or European languages, that means all tests done in China will not have tones because they are translated. Now, as it happened, in uh, Europe at least, almost all languages have grammatical gender, with very, very few exceptions, of which English is one, Ugrophenic languages are the second, and Basque is the third. All other languages have grammatical gender, and it's very, very important for the message because you have to, you have the, to agree very often the subject, object, uh, you have uh, I mean, uh, adjective, and so on and so on. And we know that it matters in aphasia. So, for instance, in German, there are nice studies of cueing the response by saying, telling the article in German, which of course the Adidas tells you which, which uh, gender the uh, word has, and patients can be cued into correct answers. In semantic dementia, very interestingly, opposite pattern, patients lose gender, but in a very systematic manner. So here, for instance, nice study by Karen Sage from, uh, I mean, in Spain, where she looked generally, like in Italian, Spanish nouns ending with A are feminine. Have gender. But there is a cluster of them, usually coming from Greek, like el paradigma, el idioma, el problema, which are uh, masculine. Now, what patients with SD do is they over... Oh, Ah, so uh, they overgeneralize by saying la idioma la problema. So again, if we simply translate a test from English, we miss all this phenomena. 
Another thing which always fascinated me is many languages have very, very strong morphological connections between different words. So let's say, I mean, this in Arabic would be to a book, letter, a scribe, I wrote or uh, he wrote, in fact, library and so on. You see, in English, it will be a lot of different words for that. In Arabic, this is all connected. In Polish, this is all also kind of connected with learning. Teach, learn, pupil, scientist, teacher, science. So again, completely different words in English, but very related in Polish. Now, I would say a very obvious hypothesis would be that for patients with broca's aphasia, it's bad news if you speak Arabic or Polish and good news if you speak English. However, I would predict that for semantic dementia, it should be the opposite. It's bad news if you speak English because you have to have everywhere, so to say, isolated. It's good news if you speak Arabic or Polish because then you can produce connections between them. We don't know. I think it would be a fantastic area to uh, describe and study. And then pragmatic, expressing politeness, very, very different in different languages as well. Now, I mentioned that it's not just that we think that all patients automatically must be English speakers. They might also be monolinguals. Now, in fact, the majority of world population is bilingual. And exactly 10 years ago, a very interesting patient uh, study came out from Białystok Group in Toronto, in Canada. They were looking at 230 dementia patients, half of them roughly bilingual, and found that the bilinguals developed dementia four years later than monolinguals. And here you see basically it was not completely out of the blue. It related to other studies about aging, about, I mean, particularly those two studies showing slower cognitive aging in bilinguals. A lot of debate about this study, whether it could have been the confound of ethnicity, education, lifestyle, diet, and so on, and particularly immigration, since most of the bilinguals came from immigrant background. Now, I've done a study here with a colleague, Suvarna Aladi, colleague from India. So we look at a much bigger group in Hyderabad with a very, very well-developed cognitive clinic and multilingual tests and multilingual stuff so that every patient can be tested in their preferred language. And we found four hours delay, but now comes something interesting. FTD delay was much bigger than Alzheimer's, much bigger than dementia with Lewy body. So it was not just dementia generally. There seemed to be an FTD effect. Now, we follow this up with another study looking now only in FTD patients, and that appeared just this year, almost 200 of them. And here, we distinguish between the behavioral variant and progressive aphasias. And here, we have a delay of onset, very strongly so in the behavioral variant, but practically not at all in progressive aphasias. Now, we wanted to look at it more systematically, so we looked now at the symptom level, so that is at the level of syndromes, but then we had also patients with motor presentation, MND, PSP, CBD, they can present mainly behaviorally or mainly linguistically. So we divided people into those who presented mainly linguistically and mainly behaviorally, and the contrast was even bigger, 6.1 years delay in behavioral presentation only 0.3 in the, uh, in the aphasic one. And interestingly, this very much fits with the, another study we've done is stroke, where we found that there was a big difference in post-stroke recovery. So bilinguals performed twice as good as monolinguals, but there was no difference in the frequency of aphasia. Although in another study, which is just in Presno in aphasiology, we found that there is more global aphasia in monolinguals. So can we, how can I explain this? I mean, these are now my last two slides. And at this stage, I cannot help having some slides of my daughter who just turned five, Alba, here. So <clears throat> what explains this kind of strange effects of bilingualism? Well, one is that exposure to different languages leads to a metalinguistic knowledge. So you kind of start thinking, oh, languages are this like this. So I played an Italian song to my daughter, and she would say immediately, oh, this is like Spanish and not like Polish or like English. So in a way, automatically from three or four onwards, kids develop ideas. Well, another very nice example, she asked me how is envelope in Spanish and Polish. In Spanish is sobre, in Polish it's coperta. So she said, coperta, but this sounds Spanish. So a recognition that this is in fact in Latin loan word, which sounds very different than most words. So that is kind of relatively intuitive and clear. However, what became much more in focus of interest over the last years is that 
very often most cases as a bilingual or multilingual you switch languages all the time so here is the example so my daughter i mean oh, when she's with her granny she knows she can speak only spanish because granny wouldn't speak a word of us with me she can speak quite a range of languages also with her good friend olivia who also speaks polish and spanish but here is my daughter with her first boyfriend, Tiatmar, who is also multilingual, but he speaks English, Dutch, and French. So then she will know that here she has concentrate, I mean, focus on English and not use the other words, whereas with Olivia, she can mix all languages. And that's exactly what already kids do and adults do. So the language mixing is very strongly connected to social cognition. And it's not surprising that, for instance, bilingual kids learn theory of mind much faster because they realize from the beginning that different people have different knowledge of languages. So therefore, it's a very small step to believe that they will have different knowledge of other things as well. However, now the important thing comes. In order for it to really work, you not only need to know this, you have to be able to implement it through uh, cognitive and particularly attentional executive control mechanism. You have to suppress the inappropriate, activate the, uh, the appropriate switch between them and so on. And that's why, interestingly, a lot of the studies showing cognitive differences show particular differences in frontal executive functions. Now, there is a price to it. Bilingualism usually leads to a slower lexical access. If you have to screen a two or three times larger vocabulary, you may need more time to retrieve a word. So from this point of view, I think it's a trade-off like everything in biology. So now coming back to, now coming back to uh, bilingualism and progressive aphasia and FTD, why do we have so different results? Well, what I would believe is that if we think in terms of interactive network, neuroplasticity, and cognitive reserve, what happens is bilingualism leads to a stronger executive networks, which then can compensate for initial frontal pathology in the behavior variant. However, if the lesion affects the core of the language system, then it's very difficult to compensate and delay it. The only thing you can get is possibly a slightly mild presentation. So I think that would be my explanation why you have this, what some people would perceive as paradoxical result, that bilingualism has such a big influence delaying the behavior variant of FTD, but practically no effect delaying the aphasic variant. So my last slide. What, where are we? Where are we heading for? Well, I would say one of, for me, the most interesting and rewarding experiences, I would say, is that the main clinical distinctions made, so to say, through observations, through linguistic analysis, have been generally confirmed through biology. So we are practically a, having a lovely example of converging evidence. Now, I think we have to see interact, I mean, language always in interaction with cognitive and motor functions. The whole point of isolated deficit in this and isolated in that is problematic, I think. I think that's something which, in a way, we probably need to move away. I think we need to move beyond the big three FTD subtypes, particularly if you want to understand the, the MND aphasia. So, I mean, it's not semantic dementia, it's not logopenic aphasia, it's not non and progressive aphasia. And we definitely need to move beyond monolingual English speakers if you want to understand human language generally. And the last thing, I'm for since the last year, I am a very, very enthusiastic Twitterer. So I put all the all the material that is available, particularly open access and so on, on Twitter, so that's where it is available. Thanks very much for your attention.